Today we're going to cover probably one of the most significant Twilight Zones to ever be created. This is not just an episode about, hey, it's a neat uh, episode and you should go watch it. This is an episode made in the early 60s that, for the most part, predicts where we are in 2024 to a level that is uh, astonishing. And it is the predictions that involve a deep state and man. And it was funny, uh, I talked to a friend of mine recently, and I hadn't talked to her in a long time, and it was like, you know, you kind of get to a point where, I don't know, are you still alive, you know? And she has an interesting career, she's an actress and what have you, and I talked to her, and she got in touch with me, and we're just talking, talking, talking about the fun stuff of life. She got married, and she's as happy as could be, and she said, uh, you know, are you back from uh, sort of like from like a right-wing thing. And, you know, this person has no grasp of any reality at all, and says so. And this is a person I would actually elect to not be involved in any of the darkness so that we have bona fide people to bring light to us, right? That's the kind of person she is. It's wonderful. I think her husband's probably the same way. For those of us that are fighting a war that no one seems to understand... It's tough to spend your life, you know, year in and year out. Uh, you could be doing much more entertaining things with your life than to be discussing any of this stuff. And I almost took a time, took a moment in the text to say, you know, you need to respect those of us who are fighting the war to get the world back to the way you used to love it. Because unbeknownst to you, we're, we're fighting and bleeding, you know, in metaphorical ways, sometimes real ways, to bring back the world that you loved and the thing that made you the wonderful person that you are that is no longer here on planet Earth. But I didn't, and that was a smart thing to do. But what this episode deals with, and it's written by Rod Serling, and you will find that uh, obviously all the writers are phenomenal, and they went off to become phenomenal uh, writers in other venues, movies, books, all kinds of stuff. But this one is a crown jewel, and it is one of the most simple scripts and simple Twilight Zones to ever be created. It has essentially two rooms, and it has an Act 1, an Act 2, and a very, very quick Act 3. Act 3 is probably two or three minutes. And this is like a 22 to 25 minute episode that runs in a 30 minute window on television. Stars the amazing Burgess Meredith. Now, for those of you coming through iPod, uh, what I do is I cut images of the actual episode so you can kind of relive it a little bit. Now, because of obviously copyright issues and because I'm trying to make points here and there, I'm going to read the scripts uh, segments that I think are very um, important. So let's get into the actual episode itself, and then we'll talk about it afterwards. It starts with Rod Serling giving us the infamous intros that he gives us. He says, You walk into this room at your own risk because it leads to the future. Not a future that will be, but one that might be. This is not a new world. It's simply an extension of one that began in the old one. It has patterned itself after every dictator who ever planted the ripping imprint of a boot on the pages of history since the beginning of time. It has refinements, technological advancements, and a more sophisticated approach to the destruction of human freedom. But like every one of the superstates that preceded it, it has one iron rule. Logic is the enemy, and truth is a menace. This is Mr. Romney Wordsworth in his last 48 hours on Earth. He's a citizen of the state, but will soon have to be eliminated because he's built out of flesh and because he has a mind. Mr. Romney Wordsworth will draw his last breaths in the Twilight Zone. Now, to set the scene of what this environment looks like, it's a really amazing room they built in a soundstage. It probably has nothing shy of a 30-foot ceiling, which you do not see. On one end, you have a gigantic door. It's very, probably two, four footers, five footers, and they're about 30 feet tall. You can't even see the top of the door. And it's very dimly lit, but the center of the room is pretty lit. And in the middle of the room is a big, long wooden table. 
At the end of the table is an assistant that sits down at the bottom, almost like a teletyper or what have you. And then there's a giant podium that's probably 20 feet tall. And in the podium is the character known as the Chancellor. Standing in the sidelines of the room is sort of your additional Supreme Court kind of people. They are listening to the case, and they will make the eventual judgment, and then it's accumulated by the Chancellor, and it's handed down to the person coming in to be evaluated. That's the mechanism of this room. And in walks a little feeble sort of mid-40s Burgess Meredith. If you don't know Burgess Meredith, you would know his face if, you're, if you've even seen anything of old, older productions. He's one of the most talented actors in the Twilight Zone series, and beautifully, I think he's up to four or five episodes before the whole series is done. Everything that he did is just the, some of the most memorable episodes. But the Chancellor obviously has to announce, why is Burgess Meredith there? His character's name is Romney Wordsworth. And that last name, which I don't think really exists in the world, maybe it does, has been handcrafted by Rod Serling. Wordsworth. Just those two words mixed together. And the Chancellor leads in by saying, Wordsworth, Romney, field investigation finding obsolescence. Do you know why you're here, Mr. Wordsworth? Yes, sir. I'd ask you to speak up a little, if you will, Mr. Wordsworth. Yes, sir. I know why I'm here. You've been under investigation, Mr. Wordsworth, for the mandatory period of one year and eleven months. You are found to be obsolete. The purpose of this hearing is to make a finding in the matter and make a sentence accordingly. Do you understand that? I understand that. Your occupation, Mr. Wordsworth? A librarian, sir. A what? A librarian, sir. Has this man had counsel? Yes, sir, he has. Has he been given orientation? Yes, sir. Mr. Wordsworth, I've been told you've been given counsel. Step back and delight, Mr. Wordsworth. I'm told you've been given counsel, Mr. Wordsworth, but I'm still not sure in my own mind that you understand the nature of this hearing. The field investigators in your sector have classified you as obsolete. This finding carries with it serious implications. Do you understand that, Mr. Wordsworth? I'd ask you again, your occupation, Mr. Wordsworth. I am a librarian. This is my occupation. That is my profession. If you people choose to call that obsolete... Request clarification of term? Yes, Mr. Wordsworth. The term, you people, you make reference to the state? I make reference to the state. And you persist in declaring your occupation as that of being a librarian, is that correct? Yes, sir. That is correct. A librarian. Having to do with books. Yes, sir. Books. Since there are no more books, Mr. Wordsworth, and there are no more libraries, and of course, as it follows, there is very little for the services of a librarian. Case in point, a minister. A minister would tell us that his function is the preaching of the word of God. And since it follows that the state has proven that there is no God, that would make the function of the minister quite academic as well. There is a God. You are an error, Wordsworth. There is no God. The state has proven there is no God. You cannot erase God with an edict. You're obsolete, Mr. Wordsworth. A lie. No man is obsolete. You have no function, Mr. Wordsworth. You are an anachronism, like a ghost from another time. I am nothing more than a reminder to you that you cannot destroy truth by burning pages. You're a bug, Mr. Wordsworth. A crawling insect, an ugly, misformed little creature that has no purpose here, no meaning. I am a human being. You're a librarian, Mr. Wordsworth. The dealer in books and two-cent finds and pamphlets and clothes stacks and the musty finds of a language factory that spews meaningless words on an assembly line. Words, Mr. Wordsworth. You have no substance, no dimension, like air, like the wind, like a vacuum that you make believe have existence by scribbling index numbers on little cards. I don't care. I tell you I don't care. I'm a human being. I exist. And if I speak one thought aloud, that thought lives even after I've been shoveled into my grave. Delusions, Mr. Wordsworth. Delusions that you inject into your veins with printer's ink, the narcotics you call literature. 
the Bible, poetry, essays, all kinds. All of it are opium to make you think you have strength when you have no strength at all. You are nothing but spindly limbs and a dream. The state has no use for your kind. You waste our time, Mr. Wordsworth, and you're not worth the waste. Instruct him. Romney Wordsworth, step back and await the finding of this board. Yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, how do you find... Obsolete. 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 I concur. Romney Wordsworth, Seth Ford, the board finds you obsolete. Your rights are as follows, Mr. Wordsworth. You are to be liquidated within a period of 48 hours, but you have an option as to the method and precise time. There are several prescribed methods, Mr. Wordsworth. Pills, gas, electrocution, that can be done immediately or an hour from now, or any specific time you request. I am a very rich man. Louder! Oh, I merely say that I'm a very rich man. I have such luxury of choices that I choose the following. To be given an assassin to whom I shall tell the method of my execution. This is unheard of. Mr. Wordsworth, we don't understand the nature of your request. Simply that you assign me my assassin, but only he and I are to know the way that I am to die. That would be acceptable, Mr. Wordsworth, provided that you are eliminated within the 48-hour period. Ah, yes. And one final request. I should like to die with an audience. Ah, Mr. Wordsworth. That can be arranged indeed. It is not unusual that we televise executions. It has an educative effect on the population. I have no doubt. Now, as for the time of the liquidation, Mr. Wordsworth... Midnight. And the place? In my room. Agreed, Mr. Wordsworth. We shall choose your liquidator and send him over to you. He will be duty-bound not to divulge the method you have decided upon. That will be all, Mr. Wordsworth. You may leave and return to your room. The Chancellor has this demeanor of just absolute authoritarianism. And Mr. Wordsworth has a very gracious, appreciative presence about him. He's humble. He's perfectly humble. If there ever was a, a, a meter put to humbleness, Burgess brings like the perfection of his character. See, by this time, Mr. Wordsworth is sort of throwing everybody off their game. They're expecting someone to come in and just cower down to the state, be read the right act, take their sentence, and just go away. But what's interesting about Mr. Wordsworth is that he's a very intelligent man. And it's sort of an implied understanding that because he is a librarian, he has read several books. And what happens when you get more knowledgeable than an idiot? You can see strategy. Remember when I was telling you in all the recent episodes that one of the things that cell phones are doing to our brains is turning us into nonlinear thinkers. We have lost as a human race, to the degree we look into a telephone, we cannot see history. We cannot see beginning, middle, end sequences in our minds. And so we're getting had easier and easier by snake salesmen because we can't see the scam. We're regressing our minds. I have a close friend of mine. If I have to say anything over a single sentence, she cannot process it. I have to slow down, let her take it in, and then I have to construct the next sentence almost like for an idiot. So that, okay, you get that? You, I got to wait for it, wait for the bullet to sink in, boom. And I will tell you that <laughs> the amount of times I get to the third sentence and I'm done speaking, that person's on the telephone, just off in La La Land, no acknowledgement I said anything. It is getting bad. But Mr. Wordsworth is not one of those people. He's a very intelligent man, and he's about to take the state on a nice little journey. So after they gave him his sentence, right, he is to be liquidated. Don't use the term killed. They did use the word assassinated here and there, but that was usually, well, that was Mr. Wordsworth who said it, and then it was only echoed by the state. The state really doesn't want to say that word. Remember how they mix up words to make sure that horrific things aren't horrific? 
Well, now we transition from this room, this state official room, into Mr. Wordsworth's room. And it's interesting how he said, go back to your room. That just means that they know that every individual in this reality has a room. And that's all you get. You don't have an apartment, you have a room. You don't have a house, you have a room. This room is full of uh, all kinds of antique furniture. It's uh, very compact, and he has tons of books in this room, which is actually kind of interesting, because in the previous section, it seems as if books are really heresy, just even having them. It doesn't matter what's in them. As the Chancellor said, there are no more libraries. But nothing's mentioned, so I guess we have to assume that even in this futuristic place, which we're probably looking at 20, 30 years in the future if we don't stop the madness that's going on in our world, they're still allowed to be possessed. But I'm pretty sure they're probably uh, certified by the state. And if you remember the movie Rollerball that I always want you guys to see, and I did a movie review of it, just check deepthoughtsradio.com, click on movies. Jonathan E. tries to go off and get books about executive decisions, and he ends up going to a library, and uh, the woman says, well, you know, we really don't have any books, and, you know, all we've got is the paraphrase of the old books that you're looking for, and Jonathan E. says, so this isn't a library, you're not a librarian, and there's no more books. I'm sorry, Mr. Jonathan. But the sequence starts off where the chancellor comes to visit Mr. Wordsworth based on an invitation. And because he has requested that the state televise this, eventually you're going to see that there were some cameras installed on the wall. It's one of those old kind of 50s um, multi-lens situations. So I'm going to go through the dialogue of what they talk about in this room because it goes in two stages. Come in, Chancellor. Thank you for coming. Very irregular, Mr. Wordsworth. You know why I've come, do you? Well, I invited you. Well, of course you've invited me. But why would I honor such an invitation? A cryptic note sent by a condemned man asking me to visit him in the last hours of his life? Hardly the norm, Mr. Wordsworth. Hardly what I'm accustomed to, and somewhat suspect, too. So you can see that the first approach by the Chancellor is to minimize this librarian. Because the Chancellor is indoctrinated. It's very clear the Chancellor grew up inside the state system, and he believes everything that they're selling. Because he was never sold anything else. Mr. Wordsworth's older. He knows the world before that. How do I know I wasn't invited here for a pitiful gesture of vengeance on the part of the condemned? Vengeance? Yes. I'm somewhat responsible for the finding in your case. Your demise in less than an hour can be contributed to my decision. I'll tell you why I came, Mr. Wordsworth. Perhaps to prove something to you. And that is? To prove to you that the state has no fears. None whatsoever. Forgive me, Chancellor. But that has an element of a joke. I mean, you come to my room to prove that the state isn't afraid of me? Why would a... Incredible burden I must be for the state to have to prove that it isn't afraid of an obsolete librarian like myself. No, I'll tell you the reason you came. I'll tell you the reason even if you won't admit it to yourself. Now, it's my turn to ask. What might that be? I don't fit your formulae. Your state has everything categorized, indexed, tagged. People like you are the strength and people like me are the weakness. You control, order, and dictate and my kind merely follow and obey. But something has gone wrong, hasn't it? I don't fit, do I? So the Chancellor's expecting him, because this is what he would do. He's projecting what he thinks he would do if he were Wordsworth. To cower down on his knees and beg and plead as the clock gets closer and closer to his life. In the hopes that, perhaps by being viewed online or on the television system, that someone will, you know, give him a pardon. Find something else for him to do. But that's when we hit stage two. Yes, you fit, Mr. Wordsworth. Indeed you fit. In a few minutes you'll be cringing and pleading just like they all do. Oh yes, indeed you fit. 
You have a worthless, meaningless little life, but you also have the instinct for survival. In a few minutes, when you feel life slipping away, when you feel that your survival is just a question of minutes, we'll see then which is stronger, Mr. Wordsworth, the state or the librarian. I take it you've had a talk with whoever has assigned your liquidation? Yes, I have a deed. Midnight, isn't it? Yes, you see, they, they brought this equipment here earlier this afternoon. These two men put it up in less than 15 minutes. It's remote control. Very efficient. Why, we're being televised now. It's not unusual that we televise executions, Mr. Wordsworth. Last year in mass executions, we televised around the clock. 1,300 people were put to death in less than six hours. You never learn, do you? History teaches you nothing. On the contrary, history teaches us a great deal. We had predecessors, Mr. Wordsworth, that had the beginnings of the right idea. Oh, yes, Hitler. Yes, Hitler. Stalin. Stalin, too. But their era was not one of excess. It was simply not going far enough. Too many undesirables left around. And undesirables eventually create a core of resistance. Old people, for example, clutch at the past and won't accept the new. The sick, the maimed, the deformed, they fasten onto the healthy body and damage it. So we eliminate them. And people like yourself that can perform no useful function for the state. So we put an end to them. What a charming room you have, Mr. Wordsworth. Have you lived here long? Just over 20 years. I built that furniture myself. Ah, yes, so I understand, Mr. Wordsworth. That incidentally has kept you alive this long. That little talent. Carpentry, you see, is a skill that the state provides considerable leeway for people who possess certain skills. Unfortunately, you went as far as you could, which was insufficient. So in a few minutes, it will be the end of a rather fruitless life, and Mr. Romney Wordsworth, librarian, goes to his own nirvana. That's what you call it in your little books, isn't it, Mr. Wordsworth? You aren't facing the camera, Mr. Wordsworth. You're cheating your audience. They'll want to see how you die. Please, face the camera, Mr. Wordsworth. That's right. And don't stifle your emotions. If you feel like crying, go ahead and cry. And if you feel like pleading, by all means plead. Some high state official might take pity on you. Yes, that would please you, wouldn't it? A little abject wrangling, chest pounded, falling down on my hands and knees. Suit yourself, Mr. Wordsworth. Unfortunately, I won't be able to be entertained by them when they do come. I have another appointment this evening. Chancellor. Make it brief, Mr. Wordsworth. You have plenty of time. You're not going anywhere. What's that? I'm afraid I haven't been very fair with you. I invited you here for a very special reason. Would you like to know the method I have chosen for my liquidation? Well, in a few moments, here in the room, a bomb is going off. Very thoughtful, Mr. Wordsworth. Relatively quick and painless death. Yes, but knowing you're about to be blown to smithereens in just a few minutes isn't the happiest thought in the world now, is it? That depends on the individual. Indeed, it does. What does the city see, Mr. Wordsworth? You've locked the door. Oh, yes. Yes, I've locked the door. So now the Chancellor finds out he's locked in the room. He can't get out. He went up to the door, tried to shake the knob, bit him adieu, and found out it was locked. And that's when Wordsworth said, you know, I haven't been completely honest with you. And that's when we find out just what's underneath the, the, the onion layer skin, the thin little layer of skin of this bravado that comes with the authoritarian state. The chancellor starts cracking. But at first he's trying to hold it in there. Claims he can work it out. So it gets down to 11.59 on the clock. There's less than a minute left and the chancellor absolutely loses his mind and begs to be left out, to be let out. Now question, how does a man react to the knowledge that he's going to be blown to bits in half an hour? That depends on the individual. As for me, I'm gonna sit down and read my Bible. It's been hidden here for 20 years. It's a crime punishable by death, so it's the only thing I have with value to me at all. So I'm gonna sit down and read it until the moment of my death how will you spend your last moments, Chancellor? This is insane, Wordsworth. Let me out of here. You're cheating your audience. You aren't facing the camera. There's no sense in raising your voice. There's nobody there. 
That's one of your rules you made up yourself. Isolate the person to be liquidated. That's what you said. Oh, no, no, no. I think there is no one there. So why don't you face the camera? It's important. You said it so yourself. I'm beginning to understand, Wordsworth. Shoe on the other foot. That's the idea. It's one thing for someone like yourself to do a little cringing and pleading. But what a choice opportunity to show the member of the state doing likewise. But you're insane, Wordsworth, if you think they'll let me stay here. They? I ask clarification of the term. They? Ah, oh, you mean the state. Oh, I think they'll sit on their hands for a while. They wouldn't want to miss the scene. Besides, the act of rescue would be very demeaning to them. To have to break in here and rescue a high-ranking member of the state. To snatch him out of the soup, so to speak. Oh, I think they won't help you. I must judge you, Wordsworth. You understand me. You wanted the whole world to see the way a librarian dies. Well, let them see how an official of the state dies, too. Face the camera. Step into the light. Let the whole country see the strength of the state. The resilience of the state. The courage of the state. Let the whole country see the way a valiant man of steel faces his death. You have a Nirvana coming, too. Why don't you sit down, and we'll have a little chat. Just you and me, and the Great Equalizer. Because death is the Great Equalizer. We'll see, Mr. Wordsworth. We'll see. So now Mr. Wordsworth has him dead to rights. He's locked in there. As far as we know, he's going to be there when the bomb goes off. And that's when Mr. Wordsworth goes over to a little cupboard and opens it up. And he says that he's going to start reading his Bible. And it's important, I think, because Rod is very strategic with everything that he writes, that he picked these, the following passages. And it just shows Mr. Wordsworth reading to the Chancellor as the clock, which is on the screen, ticking down towards midnight, because that's the time he chose to be killed. And the Chancellor's just sitting there trying to act tough. But this is the, these are the passages that he chose the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. By rod and by staff they come for me. Thou preparest the table before me in front of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Defend me from them that rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of inequity and save me from the bloody man. For lo, they lie in wait for my soul. The mighty had gathered against me, not for my transgressions, not for my sins. O God, they run and prepare themselves without my fault await to help me, and behold. Then therefore, O God of hosts, the fool that said in his heart there is no God, the Lord looked down from the heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. Out of the depths I have called unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attended to the voice of my suffocations. Please, please let me out in the name of God, let me out. Yes, Chancellor, in the name of God, I will let you out. The Chancellor steps out of the room. You see Mr. Wordsworth grab his Bible. He turns to the camera. He's got the face of like, okay, this is it. And you see a big giant bomb go off, blowing basically the door off its hinges as the Chancellor escapes just by a few feet down a staircase. And you would think it's over, except it's not. The Chancellor's got to go back to work the next day. Well, we know what room he goes to. He goes to that room from the beginning of the episode with the big podium and the big long table. And he walks in the room. And the gentleman that was down at the table, which is sort of the second in, in command, is now up in the podium. And he walks in there, and he, that's his position. And now there's no position for him anymore. And they start to tell him that he's obsolete. 
What ensues after this dialogue goes is that the chancellor is running around and the people that have been sitting on the sidelines do this really strange, almost 60s jazz hand thing. But they start humming up and they start chasing him around. He tries to escape. And the last shot we see of the chancellor, he's being dragged on the table away from the camera. And of course, like all great Twilight Zones, Rod gets an exit. The chancellor, the late chancellor was only partly correct. He was obsolete, but so was the state, the entity he worshipped. Any state, any entity, any ideology that fails to recognize the worth and dignity, the rights of men, that state is obsolete. A case to be filed under M for mankind in the Twilight Zone. And that's the core of the episode of The Obsolete Man. Now, you'll watch this episode and you will definitely feel what he's talking about. Logic is the enemy and truth is a menace. Isn't that interesting? Any state that does not respect the value of man, it is the thing that is obsolete. What I think is very interesting, because Rod Serling is technically a Jewish man, there's no sign at all that he worshipped any, or that he went to any uh, church of any kind in his real life, including any type of synagogue of any kind. He was pretty, probably pretty agnostic, but you could definitely tell that he believes in God. And he seems like he believed in God in an extremely healthy way, and that he cut a lot of the methods of man down to the metaphor of its truth and applied that to his own life, as is evident by his ability to master the writings that he did. This isn't the only episode of Twilight Zone where God, as a being, is stressed and where God is actually absolved from man's uh, distortion of God. When, when Rod writes about God, it's a very clean, beautiful, forgiving, omnipotent, all-knowing force. And I really do believe, and I've said it a million times, those of you who have intelligence and logic, you will always get to the point where you believe in God. You may not believe in any organized religion, and there's nothing wrong with that. I will say there's a lot of beautiful truths in, in sort of the writings of organized religion. It's practice and it's application. That's where you can get into trouble very quickly, depending on what era we're talking about, right? One of the things I want to really stress... And it wasn't until I really got into the episode and started breaking it down and looking at it for this episode is that the interesting thing, the duality that Rod put into this script was that Wordsworth had God. The Chancellor had the state. And the only difference between that and what we have today is we put a little word in there, deep. And I want to make a clarification. The only reason why the word deep is added to the state, is because in this Twilight Zone episode, the state was in your face. The state was in charge. The state was obviously formed out of a gaggle of idiots and morons and imbeciles to then rule over anyone with intelligence. Don't you feel like that's the way the world works? CO2 has nothing to do with heating the world at all. But that's what we espouse, is heating the world. I mean, just unbelievable idiocy. But look at the strength. If you see the episode, if you listen to the dialogue I just read, look at the strength that Mr. Wordsworth has inalienably attached to his soul, and look at the frailty of the Chancellor. We have, you know, a lot of political correctness that's been going on for three decades at least in our face, and a lot of it has to do with a moving target. Let me just get you hip to this on an atomic level so you understand how powerful these paradigms are. What is the core force of the state in this episode? Well, it's fear. Fear of obsolescence. Well, if you listen to the Chancellor's dialogue in the room, he states that the old are obsolete. You get Logan's run through the old, right? Well, now, uh, what is certain 
to happen to every single being on earth. It gets old. Humans get old. Fish get old. Animals get old. Everything gets old. So in this world, if you just do a little bit of like implication and metaphysics behind the storyline, what they're telling you in this script is that every single person in every room in this new world of the obsolete man episode will become obsolete and exterminated. Because it, even if you're useful to the last minute, you're going to get old. And when you get tired, there's no retirement. There's no relaxation. You'll be ground into the ground like a screw that just keeps getting screwed until it explodes, right? Doesn't the world feel a little bit like that right now? The, the generation that's enjoying retirement is a, is a dying breed of human beings. The, the current outlook for every single generation, especially X and below, we're to work until we die. Now, I've even said in episodes, just to clarify, I think that if you can find a love to do for a living, there's nothing more pleasurable than getting to that end. But if you happen to live to be 100 years old or something because you have good genetics and you took care of yourself, the idea that you're still going to be working in between 90 and 100 is probably unlikely. You deserve to relax at some point and smell the flowers and enjoy the world as it is, but you can't. In Soil and Green, well, they just recycled you into food, right? But political correctness is a absolutely insidious paradigm. And the reason why is that the goalposts for, for being compliant with political correctness is always a moving target. Thus, it supplies itself with an infinite renewal to create what? Fear. Fear you're not compliant. What's not compliant relate to? How many times have we heard in the last 12 months in America alone, let alone Europe and Canada and Australia, that certain words are, are terrorist words and certain words now are going to put you in jail? You're not allowed to say anything against Pfizer in France. You could be put in jail for, what, 10 years, 15 years, some crazy amount of years. Unbelievable, a corporation can now feed you poison in France, and you can't say anything bad about it. Wow. Deep state's there. The state is there. It was funny, the uh, Pentagon had come out with a thing that said, if you said illegal alien, that was going to be a, a terrorist uh, phrase and it was not allowed and then the president biden goes up on the state of the union and uses that exact phrase two-class system oh you bet we know that automation is going to be a big part of our future it's already here in many ways but in many ways they try to keep human beings involved with building cars when they really don't have to just ask toyota i mean toyotas are as far as i understand 20 years ago they're almost completely assembled by robots Humans are just there to make sure it did a good job. These factories operate in the dark, people. Can you imagine looking out into just nothing but a few little LEDs here and there, and they're all kind of moving around. You can't even see what's in there. It's like the uh, Space Mountain roller coaster. I was once in the Space Mountain roller coaster, and it was actually kind of terrifying because it's a scary roller coaster because there's beams everywhere, and you always feel like you're going to hit your head on it, but it's just that's part of the false you know, threat of its design. It's actually beautifully, unbelievably designed. But we're in the middle of it. I'm with my kid, my girlfriend at the time. All of a sudden, the car goes boom, and it stops. And we're very close to the bottom of the ride where you go through the tunnel. It takes your picture. And we're sitting there, and you just know every single car just stopped. I mean, it's just phenomenal engineering in this ride. But then they had to turn the lights on because they want everyone to get afraid. And the whole place is painted blue inside. It's crazy, sky blue. And at the time it was, it could be a different color today. But we sat there and waited and waited and waited, and all of a sudden lights went down, and boom, we were taken off again. What is more terrifying to me, and more interesting to me, is that complacent people and gluttonous human beings who have way more than they need and continue to go out and get more than they need, and devices that are rotting the brains of human beings so they can't pay attention to anything. They can't see the semi coming at them. For the state, it's a beautiful thing. 
it's been heavily engineered to be that way. Going along with the state, I saw a clip today where a guy said, you know, the reason why TikTok needs to be banned is because it's been engineered to, to indoctrinate our kids. And he goes, just watch this clip. And it was a boy in his probably late teens asking two girls in their mid-teens, maybe they're in their 20s, tops. And he said, you know, how many genders are there? And, and the other girl says, well, you know, I think there's only like two. I think there's only two. Whoa. But her, her, her friend in the middle jumps on her. Stop, stop, stop. Don't say, oh, oh, don't say anything, you know. And so that girl in the middle is the idiot who's going to help the state come into fruition. She's so terrified of being part of the crowd, right? Everybody wants to be on the winning team. That is a psychosis that is probably the most destructive thing that man has ever manifested of our consciousness. This thing of having to go along with everyone because everyone's just like, oh man, we want to be on the winning team to almost no benefit of your own, except that you think about yourself being accepted. The thing is, as I've said in previous episodes, especially the one that's uh, effort shaming or fear of perfection, I think may have been one of them, but remember how the goalpost keeps moving for the finish line inside of any type of political correctness paradigm. Okay, so say everyone agrees to use these words and we mess up every single piece of science in the planet from biology of human beings to how the greenhouse gas layer index has no CO2 in it and that's all the chemicals that heat the world. Okay, so we agree to this absolute emperor has clothes on when he's walking buck naked, fully erect down the street. Okay. The, the next thing that happens when that happens, because that's the euphoria of morons, right? Oh, everybody's all the same. Well, we're great. Well, it could be great if everyone's just the same. Well, the state will start subdividing new paradigms and new rules and new ways to be in violation of compliance within that new group. I guarantee you, before you even got close to full closure on that, they'll start subdividing constantly divide, and conquer. So if you watch the episode, you'll feel these almost subliminal feelings right when the first doors open up and Burgess Meredith walks in as Mr. Wordsworth, right? You'll be asking yourself, without maybe even consciously realizing it, how do we ever get to this point that this world exists? And that's why Rod led off by saying, this is not a future that is, but a future that might be. He was taunting us to say, look, what are, you, what are we doing with your world right now? What are your choices? And of course, we're divided into nations. And so each nation's got to create its own little culture. And because we are completely different in some cases genetically um, to our benefit. And so we have these beautiful places we like to visit. Why is, why is tourism interesting? Think about that one for one second. Why is tourism interesting? Well, it's because it's different than where you live. And of course, there's geological differences. But what if you went to Rome and there's no Colosseum? What if you went to Greece and there's no blue roofs with the white stucco buildings? You go to Germany and there's no Tudor houses or anything. The Eiffel Tower's gone. And there's nothing anywhere else. It's all just gray everywhere you go. Would there be any tourism? Of course not. It'd be all the same. And this world, having been shot in black and white, is actually phenomenally profound and sort of ironic that the people in this room, other than the heads of state, the chancellor and his boy down at the bottom, all those little judges on the side, they're all dressed in the same thing, some fascist clothing. The only difference being is they were still allowed haircuts. Remember in THX 138 and the Apple commercial from 1984, the fascist people had no hair on top of their head. Why is that? Is that just to be kind of weirdly sci-fi? Absolutely not. Hairstyles will become illegal. Everyone's heads will be shaved. And why is that? Because if you have a bald head and I have a ton of hair, I am just arbitrarily designated as the winner. Therefore, you feel jealous that I have hair when maybe in a different world, I feel jealous you lost your hair. 
I got to shave my head. Oh, my God, I want to be like you. But they arbitrarily pick a winner, and they make that, that winner illegal. When you see the obsolete man, it's very important to look at the minutia of, of suggestion in this episode. They told you in the episode that God didn't exist, that the state had proven that God didn't exist. Douglas Adams has a funny take on this in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Well, how did the state prove that? That process took place. Hmm. It's interesting that because Rod will never write a line that isn't tremendously important to the story. And so he wrote that in there to make sure that you understood the way that this moment got to the where it is where Mr. Wordsworth, Romney Wordsworth, is being deemed obsolete as a librarian. And eventually you'll find out a a carpenter. Is that the state minions, the super low IQ, low vibration human beings all got together and created this state. And they had proved to themselves that God didn't exist. Now, there's one thing to have blind faith in God, and there's another one to go down the path of, of well, you believe in God, but uh, you eventually uh, get into organized religion. You find a lot of the horrible terrors of, of the churches over years, and you lose sort of your faith in God, maybe, but not quite God himself. Then you have your atheists, and there's tons of these folks who grew up atheists, very scientific, patted themselves on the back all the time, and then they eventually became incredibly God-fearing people at the end of their lives. And the only reason, the only determinant uh, common denominator of of those last two was that the IQ of the individual exceeded sort of the basic birth IQ that were given. They subtracted all the paradigm that was blurted at them as indoctrination that God exists because our grandparents and our parents want us to believe in a God because they went down a different path and found God. So like, my kid's going to believe in God because there's benefits to this. There's benefits to your own identity, let alone some prize you get at the end of the journey. I get really turned off by people that, that I go to a church or something and they start talking about all their sins being forgiven. They're just obsessed with their sins being forgiven. I'm like, what? Do you have little Girl Scouts in your basement? So you got to constantly remind yourself that you're actually forgiving because you baptized yourself, you took Christ on as your Savior, and you got the Holy Spirit in you, so you can go off and do anything that you want. I just had this conversation with the guy the other day. I don't want that kind of uh, indemnity. I sin, I ask for forgiveness. Boom. That's how it works. That's just how it works. And because I think I might be crossing some lines that I'm not aware of, there's some generic requests in there. But Rod made sure that you understood that the state had pulled a magic trick out of a hat and convinced all the other people besides the librarian that he was obsolete. Now, the big twist in the second act, when they're in the apartment, the room, is that he got the chancellor down to the point of sort of his core uh, God-given identification. And he says the words... In the name of God, let me out of here. Huge, huge turn. And that's why Mr. Wordsworth says, yes, in the name of the God, I will let you out of here. And it makes you wonder, was he always going to let the chancellor out? Or was he trying to get the chancellor to cross that, that little line in the sand to acknowledge God because it is embedded in every single human being? You You can't get rid of it. You can mute it. You can try to ignore it your whole life. And just to digress on that one thing, because there's, it's interesting. When I was in the Bay Area, and even before I left uh, my first first stint in Southern California, there was a radio station that I could get in Ventura County and the Bay Area, and they would run these programs, and it was like a, it was kind of a fair and balanced thing where they would allow atheists to have a show. And the whole whatever three-hour stint they had on the radio, it was just bringing guests on and trying to prove that God didn't exist. And it's, it's almost like, you know, one doth protest too much. It was like deep down inside, they couldn't keep their God-given identity completely mute with their own powers because you can't overwhelm that completely. 
And so what they were doing was creating a forum where they would discuss almost completely arbitrary things that have nothing to do with God to prove that God didn't exist. It got pathetic very quickly. And they would cite things about mankind misinterpreting things and going off and being crusaders and killing people and say, see, look at that. That was a horrible event in history attached to God formally, and therefore God could not have approved that, and uh, or at least my God wouldn't approve us what they say. It's really kind of funny. They say that a lot. Well, maybe your God is more the real one. You just need to relax, you know. I don't mean this to be a religious episode on by any means, but it was definitely the linchpin of this episode. And I think it is truly the linchpin of our future. They're going after church like cra- churches like crazy, aren't they? In THX 138, Robert Duvall, again, keeps going to the prophet phone booth thing. And it's a picture of an Eastern Orthodox Jesus who's running an AI script that just basically repeats the same thing every single day. After we see it three times in the movie, you realize the script hasn't changed. There's even the pregnant pauses as if there's not true interaction with the AI. It's just playing a script. And because Robert Duvall's character, who's THX 1138, that's his designation, because he is so indoctrinated and so uneducated about any type of philosophy or origin of man, he can't hear the repetition, apparently, in his mind. What is masterfully portrayed also in the episode is Burgess Meredith's performance. It's one thing to tell an actor, okay, you need to be really humble, he's going to be the authoritative state, so you see the difference between the two of you, now go. If you've ever done acting in your life, or directing, or had to edit together the byproduct of those two things coming together, especially when you're editing, I've done lots of it in my lifetime, you're looking for expressions on people's faces. You know, if they happen to make an expression, you're trying to keep that full beginning, middle, end of the expression on camera. And the second that they finish the expression, you hold it to match the actual pace and tone of the film or story that you're editing. And Burgess Meredith um, has a, very subatomic assertiveness against the state. But he doesn't do it to the... He basically brings it right up to the degree that the state might immediately respond and penalize him, like you're out of order or you're contempt of court. He keeps it right underneath being in trouble. When the chancellor shows up to his room, he continues to play the game. And he only escalates it when he's in the last pretty much half hour of his last half hour of life. Because at that point, he's crossed that line of uh, the point of no return. And he is the master. He is the man in control. Why did he read the Bible? You might just think, well, he read the Bible to comfort himself. Well, I'm sure that it had that effect if we take that fictional world and roll it in, we roll into it and we contemplate what he was trying to accomplish there. But there's two other targets for him reading the Bible. Remember, it's being broadcast to the people. So what he was able to do, it's never said how many people are watching the program. That might have been a little interesting tidbit, but by leaving it out, Rod allowed us to synthesize in the number to match what the population of the world is at the moment you watch it. So someone watching it when there's only 100 million people in America, they envision 100 million people watching when it's 350 million or they might consider the whole world in it and it's 8 billion, maybe it's 10 billion next time it's watched. Brilliant. But he's reading those passages, those beautiful passages that will be tearing holes in the minds of the indoctrinated out there. And without knowing, you know that him reading that on camera was infecting the minds of people out there. That's what Rollerball is all about. But it's not religious. Rollerball, the movie from 1975 with James Caan, is about a guy who's playing a game that is to be the coliseum to the people, right? Have them worry about sports. This is the idiocy of the world today. While the politicians, hence the executives in this world, do whatever they want. 
But Jonathan E., James Con James Con's character, becomes the best and starts getting famous as an individual. So the executives say, whoa, 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 we can't have one guy pop out. This is supposed to be a team sport and only a team sport. And we're supposed to show the futility of individuality by playing this sport and having people watch it. But he got to be famous. And he was a very sports or team-oriented player by all means, but he had powers that other people didn't have. Skill sets that made his team, the Houston Corporation, the Power Corporation, win. So the whole movie is about, you know, about 10, 15 minutes into the film, they tell him that they're going to make him retire. He's like, what? What are you talking about? I'm at the peak of my game. And they tell him, well, it's a stupid game. And they say, you're not supposed to be this individual. It was just an idea. And that's why Rod wrote in the first act that Mr. Wordsworth says, you know, if I speak something out, those words that you think have no value, they're just vacuous words that I've made up in my head to have any significance, to give me false strength. You know, when I speak words, it turns into a thought. And long after I'm shoveled into my grave, that idea can live on. And of course, he's completely correct. Any state of euphoria that man can define at any one moment in history is just a concept because it's extremely difficult to implement. Everybody's happy all the time. That would be truly euphoria. The only thing we might have from time to time is an individual for a fixed moment in time experiences euphoria. But that's sort of nirvana. Remember, the Buddhists said nirvana is hell and heaven all at once. That's why any definition of heaven by a Christian is sort of ludicrous. Well, you live one time and you die and you just sit up there forever. So your, your moment you were alive as a human being is infinitely small and your afterlife is infinitely large. Okay, let me give you an analogy. I think God spent more time building the universe than Walt Disney spent building any, well, spent Disney, building Disneyland, right? The only park he saw. But I'm pretty sure Dis uh, Walt Disney would be pretty bummed if you only came to his park one time and rode a ride one time and enjoyed it one time. And so you can take the effort of man and compare it to the universe and go, oh yeah, we're, we're coming back. There's much more to learn, you know. I mean, again, like some people, some people in life uh, are on level one, and we call those, you know, Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, those people that just fell uphill, man. Not saying they didn't work their asses off, but in terms of opportunity, it was like a great father that worked with them to make sure they learned how to shoot film in their teens. And then, of course, they went to film school. And, of course, by the time they stepped on a set in their early 20s, they had almost 10 years' experience. How do you think I became an engineer at 18, professionally? Because I started coding at 11. Okay. So I had seven years' experience. That's why kids should have summers off. That's why this 24-hour school thing is a 24-hour indoctrination thing. We need to fight to have kids get off in May. Don't go back to school until early September. And you know what? If you raise your kids right, I can tell you, you don't have babysitters in the middle of the day. Your parents go to work and don't get in trouble. See you later. And isn't it amazing? I never lost any of my teenage, any of my, sorry, grade school to teenage friends until we started driving cars and doing stupid stuff. I didn't have anything to do with summer. So the third target of reading the Bible is obviously the Chancellor. I'll give you an analogy I think is sort of applicable here. We know when we harmonize objects, they start to atomize, right? The bridges back from the 30s that, that you know, kept flowing in the wind because the engineers didn't know that wind creates a frequency on any structure, and they didn't build it to counteract that structure. Big skyscrapers have these big uh, pendulums, or not pendulums, but these uh, structures down the center of the columns to make sure that the wind doesn't make the building sway and fall over or when an earthquake happens, right? Well, he's reading the Bible to the chancellor. Probably words that technically in this world of this episode, he's never heard those words. But Rod picked certain verses to air on television inside this episode. And they're very peculiar episodes, or, or verses, you know. 
The only one that's really well known is walking through the shadow of the valley of death. You know, that's the one that we kind of recognize. But the other ones, I think, are very interesting. The passages have a theme, which is empowerment because God exists within this individual. There's a passage in the Bible during the New Testament when Jesus is asked to create fish for a bunch of hungry people. And of course, the story goes that he teaches them how to fish and not to just, here, take this and be dependent on me. Being dependent on others is a sign of low IQ, low vibration thing, except for in in the case of a child. We are to grow up and supplant the dependency of our parents with our own knowledge and our own skill sets, having derived that from our parents, our aunts and uncles, our grandparents, and maybe family friends that are of the same ilk. What I find interesting is, is that, you know, we've, uh, those of us who have been very successful in life, uh, whatever it is, right, we have a hard time trying to teach young kids that, you know, being on your, being fully dependent on yourself at a certain age, at least by 18, is important and it's very rewarding. And when you have a job or you end up doing a great job and you get some sort of recognition, may not be personal recognition, but you see people use your product or service and you're like, man, they really love it. And I was a part of that. That feels good. It's hard to teach that, especially hard to teach it in words. And sadly, what I'm about to say is not the the actual life of all children, but it's still life of most children. And that's learning how to ride a bike. The sad part is, is the kids that grow up in cities, they don't learn how to ride a bike. Ever. And But you know that if you ever learned how to ride a bike, and you're listening to my voice, there was something beyond just balancing that made you feel utterly amazing when you could control the bicycle. It's almost like a God thing. When my kid was born, I felt like God was in the room with me and just utterly changing who I was as a human being. It just was like a video game when you see the character hit the next level and they run a big animation on top of the character. That's like what was going on when I was staring at my child coming out of her mother. When you balance a bike, you then gain a tool to become independent to drive around the neighborhood. And if you were lucky to grow up in the world that they want you to hate, the 60s, 70s, 80s, what have you, man, you could just get on your bike and, you know, I lived in country towns, I lived in fairly large cities, and, you know, you just learn where not to go, where to go, how the traffic does their little things, but, man, you could just get on your bike and go wherever the hell you wanted to. I had a motorcycle by the age of eight, and if my parents only knew how far I drove away from where I lived, they would be utterly shocked. I don't know how far away I went, probably... Five, ten miles away from town, doing jumps and stuff and weird structures I found. I could have died at any point in time, but I didn't because I wasn't stupid. I just gradually built into everything, like most of us, right? The obsolete man is essentially Orwell's 84, Huxley's Brave New World. It is its own encapsulated episode of caution. I almost wish it was made during season four when the episodes went 45 minutes because they could have added a little bit more depth to it. But it is absolutely a jewel of Twilight Zone perfection. And it seems like one of the fastest episodes you'll ever watch because it's so quick. There's only two sets. And the first set's used for three minutes for the final act. That's it. And there's only really two characters. And so you get concentrated character development within this cautionary tale of allowing there to ever be a state. But that begs a new question that you're not going to expect to hear in this episode. Where is man supposed to be going in this universe? Are we supposed to hone out ways of creating a global government that's good so that no corruption can ever happen and trust that system? Are we supposed to create artificial intelligence to then be pre-programmed to control everybody so that they can't violate any rules? Or are we supposed to create a third thing, which is that we create inalienable rights for human beings, a do-no-harm law system, 
and all be individuals acting as a society. I will tell you that in my observations of probably the last 120 years, okay, just studying history, right? Coming from a small town where I had conversations with people that were born in the 1800s, it looks like the most prosperous, happy uh, moments in time have all been when the individual is, is protected. You keep the state off of them. You have do-no-harm laws. That's when humans help humans the most. And the first time you get a group, you get the Democrat KKKs, right? Where you got Democrats all the way through the 60s yelling at black kids trying to desegregate from schools while your supposed racist right-wingers are helping them get integrated with folks. Breaking down this ridiculous problem that we had created. But it was a group that created that resistance, If individuals go for individuals, that's when, again, you don't have this mob rules mentality, this group think problem. You don't have the girl jumping on her friend for simply acknowledging, which is biologically proven, there's only male and there's only female. Sorry, boy, girl. What's really funny about the whole gender dysphoria thing is that every liberal website you might go to or liberal organization you go to, when it really comes down to having to identify who you are. They want to know if you're a boy or a girl. The only thing they've done is they've added a third one that says, I don't want to say. Because if it's a hospital, you can't say you're uh, a ham sandwich. You can't. You got to tell them what you are because they're going to have to record it that way because they're going to have to give you medicine according to and procedures according to what you really are. They have to. Another super fascinating thing that happens in this episode is in Rod's opening statement, he talks about the state, and he talks about technical advancements, referring to the fact that the state uses new technical advancements to enforce the state, to make sure, again, logic is the enemy and truth is a menace. Technical advancements. Okay, this is the early 60s. Well, what could Rod have been referring to I think he was referring to Marshall McLuhan's entire mantra, which is medium is the message. Just to remind you guys, you should be repeating this to other people, which is why I like to repeat it to you. Marshall McLuhan's caution to the world was that it's more important that you pay attention to the media method they're giving, that's delivering the information, than the information itself. Damn well knowing that the information is also of paramount importance. He's trying to make a point. He knows that you know the information is really important. Someone's lying to you, indoctrinating you, propaganda, etc. But he says, if it's delivered in one technology, it has one effect on you, and a tell a vision has a whole other effect on you. The radio has an effect on you. And look at the people that still think we went to the moon just because they saw it on a television. Unbelievable. Right? No science in their head, but they saw it on the TV, so it's real. Okay, early 60s. Not a lot of like global surveillance or anything like that. No one was online, right? The internet was in its infantile military state in the early 60s. So you advance up to 2024. Oh, (laughs) major difference, okay? We don't communicate person to person as much unless you smoke cigars. That's a little secret about these sticks being on the show. You sit down in a room like this. There's chairs, you buy your stick, you sit down, maybe there's a television going. Usually it's some streaming cool stuff like a Twilight Zone or a movie or just some YouTube channels, Rumble videos or whatever, if you're in a cool lounge. But a lot of times we'll just turn it down and just talk. I had an old guy in here the other day. I don't hold this guy. He's a former doctor. He sat down. He came about 9 o'clock. He pushed at the door. Wasn't expecting anybody. Didn't leave until 1 o'clock in the morning. We talked for four hours. Felt like about an hour and a half. He wanted information, but didn't want it from someone who was going to bully it into their head. So I read the room. I read how he thought about things because I know his generation really, really well. And he's sort of sitting in the middle, which is good. And he just wanted to compare notes for four hours. What do we do today? 
Text, 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 text. Message, 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 message. Post, 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 post. They get to see everything that you're thinking 24-7 because you don't have a place like this. And seeing somebody, ah, you know, it's just crazy. Uh, my, my high school sweetheart's father told me, and the first dinner we had together, it's really kind of odd, but I, I think he's, it was kind of cool he said this. He goes, uh, he goes, I was told, he goes, I was told that if you can, uh, at the end of your life, if you can name three people that would give their life for you, you're the luckiest man in the world. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. And I took me forever. I'm not, I mean, I don't even sure he completely grasped that himself. He was in no position to need that kind of uh, friend. He lived a charmed life and had a wonderful family and yada, yada. Still to this day, I think he's living a wonderful life. God bless him. But he was right. Because finding one is super difficult. Two is nearly impossible. And three is like, okay, you've hit the massive ultra jackpot of the entire world. It's different than uh, the old phrase, uh, uh, friends will help you bury your body. Someone who would give their life, their entire future is gone because they saved your life. Specifically for you, not just a soldier that's saving everybody. Those people are heroes on a whole different level. In a state situation, that paradigm doesn't exist, right? But today, everything is virtual. Virtual, virtual, virtual. You have probably had the moment, like all of us, where you join some sort of social media for the very first time. You're a young person or an old person getting on board, and suddenly you'll have a couple hundred friends. And you'll look at your little count, and there'll be a point where you're like, I want more. I want more, you know? YouTubers, man, they just worry about their subs. There's two reasons to worry about subs. One I think is valid, and one I think is just pure vanity and a waste of time. If your subs mean you're a good, you're an amazing person to you, if that's what it's all about, then that's the wrong reason. If you're trying to spread information that you think is extremely important, then subs is your reach. It's how many people are being affected by your contribution. What you need to understand, though, is that your views also matter, how many people watched it. Maybe they're not subscribers. Maybe they're not that kind of person. Maybe they found you on YouTube, but they actually subbed on BitChute or Rumble or whatever. They just simply find you every day. They don't need a sub. Maybe they don't have an account. They don't want an account, but they watch it anyway. But Rob was on to something. Anyway, I think this is super important. The only place you can really easily get Twilight Zones is on Paramount+. Plus. I will say that the all the episodes have been up incredibly. I mean, I have never seen it so beautiful in my life. And you have the outros, uh, which is actually, sorry, you have the introduction of the next episode at the end of every episode, which is something even me as a, I own all the DVDs, 43 DVDs, they're off in storage somewhere. They, they don't have those either. You could buy the DVDs, at least when I bought them in the 90s, and you, you won't have that extra thing. It's really sad. But anyway, Paramount's done a good job cleaning them all up. It's a little rough at first, but they've cleaned them up. Those of you who are BitTorrent um, experts, you can definitely get copies of those on your hard drive. So I, I literally subscribe to Paramount Plus for Star Trek and uh, uh, Twilight Zone and found a bunch of old movies and stuff, so it's kind of cool. So if you need to see it, that's one way you can see it. If you don't have it, just ask a friend. Ask someone to help you find it. The Twilight Zones are important. I want to I want to exit with this one little tidbit to sort of give you the significance of one dimension of which I see the the value of Twilight Zones. Probably in at least twenty Twilight Zones, the subject of atomic war, nuclear war, was brought up, either in a post-apocalyptic. Uh, Look how we screwed up the world to people messing around, fearing it was going to happen, and then it didn't happen, or some version of this sci-fi series called Twilight Zone. Well, it's 2024, and we haven't had one. Of course, they're really ramping up possibilities this year. I still don't think they'll do it. Who knows? But at least we made it this far. 
And for me, I think that those who would make the decision or express themselves that they don't want to have a nuclear war are the most intelligent people on planet Earth. And they just so happen to be those who are avid fans of Twilight Zones. If you haven't gotten into Twilight Zones, don't worry. You're in for the biggest treat of your life. But I really think that Rod, by encapsulating truth inside of a sci-fi wrapper, and it being syndicated like the works of Shakespeare, right? Every single minute of every day, a Twilight Zone's being viewed. I would love to see the God stats on it, right? It must be 100 people watching every split second of the day at a, at a minimum, let alone a marathon air, airing on TV. But that helped us get conditioned to good information, good possibilities, good repercussions, good cause and effect models. It's important. And sadly, Rod smoked too much and was knocked out at 50 years old in 1975. He was a mind like Dr. Saul. We need good minds, lucid minds, to continue uh, infecting the future. Dr. Saul is like 93 years old or something, posts every day, something online, and it's just so profound, man. He can either make his new statement or quote himself from the past, and your jaw will just be on the ground for what you were able to read there. Anyway, that's my love for this episode and where I think the value is. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Anyway, if you haven't been to deepthoughtsradio.com, please go. Everything's up there. To the PayPal and Patreon folks, thank you so much. You make it happen. Take care of yourself and someone else, and I'll see you on the next Deep Thoughts. Over and out.